Welcome to Holy Trinity Church online worship service. If you are joining us for the first time, please like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Connect with us through our Facebook page and we hope to see you when we resume our physical worship. The link and address are in the description of this video. Psalm 100 verse 4 to 5 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. The Bible calls us to worship and praise the glory of God. Wherever we are, whatever the time, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to enter into his presence to, and to worship God with songs with thanksgiving and praise. Let us pray. Lord, you are the creator of heaven and earth and all things in it. We want to praise and worship you today. We choose not to be overwhelmed with circumstances, but instead to behold your beauty and your goodness. We choose to praise your name and proclaim your salvation day after day to declare your glory among the nations, your marvellous deeds among all peoples. May you be honoured, may you be glorified in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer Him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive His Holy Word, to bring before Him the needs of the world, to ask for His forgiveness of our sins and to seek His grace that through His Son Jesus Christ we may give ourselves to His service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment to reflect on the week past and allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin so that we can come with a contrite heart for confession. Let us now pray the confession prayer together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us receive God's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be here to worship the Lord together. So now let's sing our song, I will praise you, Lord. Thank you. 
Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. Verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. and He must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning, we'd like to look at the next topic in our sermon series on a church pastor or a leader to follow. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you give to us. We pray, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon the preaching, the hearing, the receiving, the applying of the word in each of our lives, so that, Lord, we will learn how to become the leaders that you want us to become, with godly character and with lives that are worthy to follow even. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, everything rises or falls with leadership, be it in a family, organization, or church. As we read in the Bible, we know that the Holy Spirit imparts gifts to believers for ministry in the local church. And among these gifts are gifts of pastors and teachers, helps, governments, or administration. And the word overseer refers to a pastor, elder, or anyone who exercises an overseeing function. The New Testament uses several words for church leaders. Bishop, pastor, and elder are synonymous. Bishop means overseer, and he had to oversee the work of the church. Elders and bishops were mature people with spiritual wisdom and experience. Finally, pastor means shepherd, one who leads and cares for the flock of God. It was good for a growing believer to aspire to church leadership, and the best way was to develop godly Christian character and to be an example so that others could follow. Woodrow Wilson, after his presidency, was asked what the greatest honour had been in his life. Do you know what his reply was? He said, to be an elder in the Presbyterian Church. It was truly amazing that the pr former president considered being an elder as the greatest honour and privilege in his life. As we look in verse 1 here, we see Paul writes about desire. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So Paul here outlines certain character qualifications or even requirements for leaders in the church. And first thing is desire. So he cited a trustworthy saying regarding church leadership you know, leadership is a noble task, an excellent occupation. Yes, we should pursue leadership roles in the church, but our desires must focus on pleasing Jesus and serving people. Are you in spiritual leadership now? Or would you like to be a leader someday? Well, I hope that today's message will help us to grow, to become the leader that God wants us to be. Aspire means to reach out after, to stretch out oneself, to grab something. Desire means a passionate compulsion. It is not so much a drive to be a leader, but a drive to serve, to desire a good work. Leadership is good work to care for, to pray for, and to serve God's people. And when God calls anyone to serve, including becoming a leader, He gives that person that heart, that discipline to pursue it. Philippians 2.13 says that God works in us to will and do of His good pleasure. When God looks for someone to use, He looks for those who has allowed themselves to be burdened by God, to see the loss and the needs of the church, and they have a desire 
to serve. Brothers and sisters, in what ways are you aspiring? You know, and do you desire to serve the Lord in leadership? Um, point number two, Paul then outlines some of the expected qualities. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. First of all, be above reproach. Point number A. Mel means nothing to hold, take hold upon. There must be nothing in his life that Satan or anyone can take hold of to criticize, accuse, or attack. No man is sinless, but we must strive to be blameless or above reproach. A church leader must have a good reputation amongst believers because our lives either honor or dishonor Christ. They either draw or push people away from Jesus Christ. Are there any areas in your life that Satan could take hold of or accuse you or the church? If so, how can you get rid of these weaknesses in your life? Be being faithful in marriage. Paul says that the person, the leader is to be the husband of one wife, faithful to his wife. A leader must be faithful in his marriage, not be divorced or even remarried. And Paul was not referring to polygamy or to remarriage after the death of a person's wife. A leader who has been divorced opens himself to criticism from outsiders as people with marital difficulties would unlikely consult a person who could not keep his marriage together. David Guzik, a Bible commentator, said, no, this means that the biblical leader is not a playboy, an adulterer, a flirt, and does not show romantic or sexual interest in other women, including the depictions or images of women in pornography. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 25 to 27, Solomon's father warned him, of the adulterous woman. He says, Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not wander into her pathways, for she has brought down many fatally wounded, and all those she has slain are many. Her house is the way to the grave, going down to the chambers of death. In the Bible, we read of Samson, David, and Solomon who succumbed to sexual sin. If married, our eyes and hearts should be only on our spouse, and we must remain a maintain appropriate boundaries with members of the opposite sex. So brothers and sisters, how can we remain faithful in our marriage? What are some of the good boundaries that we need to maintain with members of the opposite sex? C, be temperate. It means to be vigilant, to be alert, to be watchful, to be sober. Well, his, a leader's life should be marked by moderation. Limits, not extreme or excessive. A leader needs to exercise sober, sensible judgment in all things. He needs to be wise and careful. We need to be wise and careful even about our eating, our drinking, our sleep, our entertainment, our exercise, and all our relationships. How can you and I be temperate as a leader? D, be self-controlled. Well, a leader needs to possess sound and balanced judgment even common sense. You know, Paul mentions self-control as necessary for older men in Titus chapter 2, verse 2. Older and younger women, Titus 2, verse 4 and 5. And young men in Titus chapter 2, verse 6. Practical wisdom should mark the lives of believers and leaders. Warren Rearsby described the leader's self-control as he must have a serious attitude and being earnest about his work. This does not mean that he has no sense of humor or that he's always solemn and somber. Well, he knows the value of things and does not cheapen the ministry or the gospel message by foolish behavior. How then can we exercise self-control? Think of ways you can exercise self-control. E, a leader needs to be respectable. And this refers to basic social graces or orderly good behavior. A spiritual leader must have an orderly, well-disciplined life. God is a God of order, not of chaos. So as you and I grow in our spiritual maturity, we need to discipline our body, our mind, our, and our whole life so that it is pleasing to the Lord. F. Hospitality or being hospitable. This refers to loving the stranger. And this was widely emphasized in Middle Eastern culture and even in the Old Testament. This was an important ministry in the early church 
when traveling believers would need places to stay. You know, when I went to Melbourne for ministry last October for two weeks, I thank God for the hospitality that was given by the local Anglican priests who hosted us. You know, believers are also commanded to be hospitable. This does not just refer to leaders as well. So think of some ways you can show hospitality today. G, being able to teach. You know, Paul only singles out one responsibility or ability for a leader, and that is the ability to teach. You know, what task has Jesus given to the church? Well, we are to disciple the nations through teaching, sound doctrine, and living. Some leaders specialize in preaching and teaching. Others specialize in ruling, overseeing the church, caring for the flock of God. Well, a leader must understand and communicate the truths of Scripture and deal with false teachers who mishandle God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. One can teach through mentoring as more is learned even through living than through lectures. How can you and I be committed to the study of God's Word so that we can continuously upgrade ourselves in the Lord's, God's Word and be an effective and able teacher of the Word of God? Well, point number three, we need to avoid negative traits. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Paul then listed four characteristics or traits that the leader must not have. He says he must not be given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. A. Not given to drunkenness. Well, this describes a person who sits long with a cup and drinks to excess. And the fact that Paul advised Timothy to use wine for medicinal purposes indicates that total abstinence of wine was not demanded of believers. Sadly, some members of the Corinthian church got drunk even at the love feast that accompanied the Lord's Supper. The Jewish people normally diluted their wine to make sure it was not too strong. In those days, the water was also not so clean, so adding a little wine helped a lot, in a sense, for one's body. Scripture does not forbid drinking alcohol. The early church used it during the Lord's Supper. However, Scripture warns us about drunkenness. Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. B. A leader must not be violent, but gentle. Well, not violent can be literally translated as not a giver of blows. A violent person is an abusive person, and abuse can cover verbal, physical, sexual, spiritual. But it arises from a deep disrespect for others. Charles Spurgeon told his pastor's college students, don't go about the world with your fist doubled up for fighting, carrying a theological revolver in the leg of your trousers. In contrast to violence, Paul notes and highlights the value of gentleness that is much desired. A gentle person is free from harshness, sternness, or violence. John MacArthur says that a gentle person is one who is considerate forbearing, gracious, who easily pardons human failure. Such a person remembers good, not evil. He does not keep a list of all the wrongs done to him or hold a grudge. You know, in ministries, many times we as leaders will be criticized and attacked even when we may be serving God faithfully. But we must be able to respond in a gentle manner to prevent division and even possibly church splits in the body of Christ. So how then can you and I be gentle in response to criticism or wrongs that may be committed against us? C. Not quarrelsome. Where Paul says leaders should not be quarrelsome. You know, a quarrelsome person tends to be defensive, insecure, and even insensitive. Leaders must be peacemakers, not troublemakers. They need not compromise their convictions, but they can disagree without being disagreeable. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 24 and 25, it reads, And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind towards all. An apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and their knowledge of the truth. D. Not be lovers of money. A Christian leader should be free from the love of money. 
as the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Besides money, one can also cover materialism, popularity, a large ministry, denominational advancement. Ministry should not be chosen for career or financial aspirations. At the end of his life, Samuel challenged Israel. He says, Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whom have I cheated? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe? And the people replied, You have not cheated or oppressed us. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 following. You know, would all church leaders, including independent ministers, be able to meet God's standards in regards to not being lover of money? How can we have the right attitude towards money in our life and even in the ministry? Look at verses 4 and 5 on family leadership. Well, a leader must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? The word manage means compassionate governing, leading and directing, not stern, cruel, tyrannical, and authoritarian rule. A married leader is called to leadership in two families, his own family and God's family, the church. And he is to lead with the same love, compassion, firmness, and mercy. You know, if a man is not willing to care for, discipline, and teach his children, he's not qualified to lead the church. The leader does, does this in a manner worthy of full respect. It means that his family should be a model for others to follow. So he cares for his family in a dignified manner that encourages and draws respect from others around him. So leaders and even Christians in general, we must manage our family well to be a powerful and a good witness and testimony to others. Remember Eli the priest? Well, he remains as a solemn warning to us in this area. You know, his sons were both immoral and greedy in the temple, and he failed to restrain them. And God passed judgment on them in 1 Samuel chapter 3. How then can you and I be faithful in caring for our family, for our parents, our spouse, even our siblings and our children. Next point number five, spiritual maturity. He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Yes, he must not be a recent convert it means that he must not be one that's newly planted, referring to a very young infant Christian. And the ministry of a leader requires experience, wisdom, understanding, and spiritual maturity in view of the pressures and temptations that a leader faces. New believers need to become strong in the faith and live a godly Christian lifestyle, have a knowledge of the Word of God before even taking up leadership positions in the church. And Paul says that maturity is needed so that he does not become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Well, conceited means to be wrapped in smoke. You know, a person can become so inflated with pride that he cannot get a true picture of himself. And pride means comparing oneself to others and setting oneself up as being superior to others or better than others. It demeans another person's status or contributions if only in one's thoughts. So new believers who are promoted too quickly into leadership can become easy targets for the devil's powerful temptation of pride. You know, pride can seduce our emotions and can cloud our reasoning. It can make those who are immature susceptible to the influence of unscrupulous people around them. Pride was the devil's downfall and he, the devil continues to use pride to trap many today. Thus, humility before God in a life of personal devotion and commitment, faith and obedience to the Lord is much needed amongst leaders. How then can you and I grow in humility and get rid of perhaps any pride in our lives? Last but not least, having a good testimony or good reputation. Verse 7, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Well, finally, church leaders being the most visible people in the church to the outside world, we must maintain the best reputation as we hold public office, which requires public esteem. You know, when Christian leaders have a bad reputation, 
when they wrongfully use solicited funds, they don't pay their taxes, or they fall into sexual immorality, it damages the church, it damages the body of Christ, and it keeps non-believers from coming to Christ. Our mission is to bring the lost to Christ and into the church of Jesus Christ, where we disciple them. So does our conduct help or hinder the cause of Christ to pre-believers around us? Those who profess godliness at church but practice drunkenness, immorality or dishonesty throughout the whole week open the door for the devil to trap and accuse them and bring dishonor upon God and his church. A Christ-like life draws non-believers to Christ or an ungodly life pushes non-believers away from Christ. You know, if the world were to look at us and they say, Oh, you're no different from me. Don't you preach the gospel to me because you're not living out the gospel. Well, then we don't have anything else to say to them that they will hear. But if we go out into the world with a good reputation and a testimony shining the character of Christ in our life, we are different from the world. We are caring, we are loving towards the world. Well, Jesus promises that the world will stand up and take notice of our lives and they will be drawn to our Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, as I conclude this message today, I'd like to remind us, well, God is not looking for paper qualifications or even degrees, our skills or our accomplishments in our life. But He looks for men and women with the right hearts and with qualities that reflect character of Jesus Christ. So I encourage us, may you continue to pray for our pastors, for all leaders and their families. You know, the enemy wants to destroy leaders and we covered your prayers. Perhaps you are here, you are here listening to this message. You know, do you desire to serve and lead because it's a noble task? What steps can you take so that you can grow in leadership one day? How do you and I match up to God's standards regards to church leadership? What are some areas in our life that needs the change that only God can bring? Weakness in our life that we need God's transformation to turn it into strengths. How then can you and I be a godly model so that others can follow? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We continue to pray that, Lord, we are weak but you are strong. Lord, there are many areas in our life that needs the change that only you can bring. So Lord, we welcome you to transform us from glory to glory. Continue to sharpen us, continue to refine our character so that we will reflect the character of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we will have all these godly qualities that are expected of leaders, Lord, that you would desire us to have, Lord. So help us, Lord. Help us to grow in our leadership and may you continue to help us to be an example, a godly example, so that others can follow. And we pray that, Lord, you will use us to bring you the greatest glory in our life and in the church. So we thank you and we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us read the collect for today, the 11th Sunday of the Trinity, together. Almighty God, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ, reconciling men to yourself, help us so to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be reconciled to you, through him who died for us and rose again and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder that we have been called to be witnesses for Christ and this opportunity to intercede for the places and the people whom you love. We now pray for the world, that your mercy and grace will be upon the countries who continue to battle the COVID-19 virus, particularly in South Korea where a large cluster comprising members of a local church have contributed to a surge of new infections. We pray for the governments of the world to be able to allocate the resources they have on hand with wisdom and compassion to ensure that the poor and marginalised in society will have access to help when they need it, and generally lot for the safety of the people, even as these countries gradually reopen their economies. May you grant strength and knowledge to the different teams around the world who are racing against the clock to find a vaccine. We also want to pray for the Diocese of Singapore. We uphold Bishop Rennes and Bishop Designate Titus Chung, the Diocesan Office and the Diocesan Clergy Team, that they will experience a renewal of strength and refreshment in their spirit as they serve you and lead your flock. May you grant them unity and a clear vision, even as they deliberate over preparations and issues during these pandemic times and during this period of transition. We pray too for all the clergy, and especially the six who will be out there uh, on the 23rd of August. May you grant them divine strength to overcome the pressures of ministries and for a daily renewed love for you and others. May you watch over to Lord their ongoing personal growth as they continue to serve you and your people. Lord, we want to thank you for the children ministry and for the net ministry that they can continue to have fellowship and teachings online. We ask for wisdom, strength and even creativity upon the children workers and the net leaders to make this possible. May the children and the youth in the net ministry continue to have a fruitful and God-honouring time even as they participate in these online programs. We pray to Lord for your special anointing over Reverend Michael even as he prepares his teaching on the topic be open to the Holy Spirit, which will take place on the 28th of August. We pray, Lord, that during this time of learning, the members will be able to increase in their hunger for your word and to find and experience great joy in uncovering and applying your word into their own personal lives. Let us spend a moment of quietness and commit the names of those we know who are suffering in body, mind and spirit to prayer. Father God, we commit the names of the people who have come to mind, to you. May you grant comfort and healing to them, courage and hope in their troubles, and the opportunity to experience the true joy of knowing you as their personal Lord and Saviour. May your grace be sufficient for us, that your strength be made perfect in our weaknesses. All these we ask and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I'd like to highlight some announcements for us to take note of. Well, this coming Friday, we encourage you to come and join us and learn on how to know the will of God, even and being open to the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the mind of God, even through scripture, through inner voice, through dreams and through visions. Do register in the link that is available in the bulletin and then join us this coming Friday at 8 p.m. Let us learn and grow together to be a people of God who are disciples of Jesus Christ walking by His Spirit, living you know, in the center of His will. Next, we are looking for volunteers to help us to prepare as we think of going to live stream our services in the near future. So those of you who are interested you know, in video editing and in some of these areas, please contact Pastor James directly. Next announcement, I'd like to remind us to continue to be faithful in our giving to our tithes and our offerings so please uh, give generously towards the work in god's kingdom even at our church let us now receive god's blessings the peace of god which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of god and of his son jesus christ our lord and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Well, God bless you and see you again 
at our next online service next Sunday. Take care.